All right, well, let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, I don't know if anybody's actually going to pop into the chat or not, but we are here tonight to do... Uh, well, first of all, I'm testing out live streaming for the first time. I've never done that before, so uh, we're trying it out, but I'm also going to do a Torpedo Comics unboxing uh, for their recent uh, G.I. Joe mystery box they sent out. Uh, and uh, if I'm boring, you can watch my wife play Skyrim in the background. So there's that. Uh, we should have plenty of entertainment for everybody. Hey, Dream of August, how's it going? So I'll see if anybody else trickles in. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely taking questions in the chat. If anybody wants to ask me questions about my channel or about uh, comic books in, in general. Um, hey, thanks. I appreciate that. I was, I was really curious how that's looking. Uh, spent some time earlier today noodling around with it and seeing if I could get it to work right. So glad to hear it's working okay. So I'm going to dive into this mystery box or at least get it ready to go here. So if people are watching on the replay, they at least have some kind of entertainment. So this is my first uh, Torpedo Comics box, guys. Um, yeah, Skyrim, Skyrim is definitely addictive. Um, I, I think I've played it on three platforms now, and I know people have played it on way more than that. Thank you for purchasing the G.I. Joe Mystery Box. I figured this goes pretty well with my uh, Monday mail call that I put out this week uh, where I had some G.I. Joe pickups. And there's even more of those coming, too. So how's your night going, Dream of August? I always got to remember there's a delay, too. I forget about that. So I will... Oh, glad, I'm glad you're here. It's going great, man. That's awesome. Um, I will point out, I don't get why everybody uses scotch tape still. Like, this one has tape on all four sides... Guys, switch over to painter's tape. It's not hard. And and bonus points, switch over to painter's tape and then do pull tabs. Pull tabs make everything go so much better. Editing, creating video thumbnails, etc. Yeah, that's that's become like all my free time. You know, you think about the recording part and you're like, oh, that's the fun part. And then you forget about all the other work that goes into it. <laughs> So it's like usually when my daughter goes down to bed, I, I start doing thumbnails or editing. All right, we're almost in. Yeah, blue painter's tape for sure. Although I've seen, uh, there's at least one seller I buy from on Instagram, uh, Hulk Nuts. He uses green painter's tape and it works pretty good too. I'm not really sure. I know there's different colors that have different like stickiness. So even though I don't love how this is taped up, I will say it is packaged well. I've gotten a lot of shipments recently that were not, not packaged well. Um, so, at least it's arriving, you know, intact and in good shape. All right, so first up, we've got uh, the G.I. Joe 275, uh, the uh, trade dress. And then we got the Virgin. And that's all that's in here. Not really much of a mystery box. That's the comic they advertised, but... Oh well. I mean, it's still a cool cover. It's what I wanted. 
Uh, do you have a first appearance of Sergeant Slaughter? I found a direct edition and newsstand both together in the wild. Yeah, I think. Did you make a post about that? I feel like I saw that. Um, yeah, I do have a direct edition. Um, probably, probably like an eight point five. Um, I think at this point I've got most of the keys. Now that I've got fourteen, which is the first full Destro and and cover appearance of Destro pretty much covers most my most my major first appearances there's a ton of really small ones you know like uh figures that got released in the the late 80s and early 90s and then i don't have a lot of the the scarce print run one like the you know 140s in in that run um yeah i thought i saw a post about that um but yeah it's it's tough i mean G.I. Joe, I feel like it's it's one of those things where like all the keys are always missing from the bins. Um, you know, I'd, I'd pay a couple extra dollars for one, too, but they're usually just gone. So, um, All right. Well, once again, I'll just show off those comics real fast. That is a, a very cool Destro cover. And then the trade dress. That is interesting. I, I was kind of under the impression that there was going to be a couple other comics in there. Some cool Dreadnought action. So that's pretty neat. Um, so yeah, mostly this is just up because I did want to test out live streaming. Um, so so Dream of August is in here. Um, sounds like there's a chance we're going to be doing something together pretty soon. So. Uh, wanted to kind of kind of see if live streaming worked for connecting to somebody else through OBS, that kind of stuff, trying out some stuff on the channel. Um, I think, uh, so Dream of August just asked how much this box was. I want to say this one was 25. So, I mean, that's about right for a, for an exclusive cover, but I just, I don't know, I guess I expected a couple, like throw in an old Marvel G.I. Joe or something. Um, again, it's my first torpedo box. Maybe that's standard for them. Uh, I know they have more expensive boxes. Maybe they throw in extra comics in those, but I just saw it and I was like, hey, a G.I. Joe exclusive. I'm, I'm probably going to jump on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wanted to test out streaming, um, see what this looked like. It's something I've kind of thought about uh, uh, doing and, and kind of playing around with others uh, on the YouTube space here. And uh, I know there's a few people out there that'd be fun to, to do videos with. And also it's just fun chatting with people and, and interacting and... Uh, Talking to all you guys. You stay away from mystery boxes. Yeah, I I have done a couple. I did a very Gary Comics had his first mystery box, which was a slab box. And what I liked about his mystery box is, yes, it was a mystery box, but he also showed off everything you were going to get inside the box ahead of time. So every slab that was going to be in there, he went through. I think there was a, a hundred um, that he did. And he showed you every slab. So you knew exactly what you had a chance of getting. And none of the slabs were duds, really. They were all pretty good. Um, and I got a first uh, Gwen Stacy, Spider-Gwen, out of it, like a fifth printing. But still, you know, decent comic. Um, and then he showed off, like, uh, I think there was a Turtles comic in there. Um, it was a Ryan Brown exclusive cover. And you had a, some other things you could get, like trading cards and stuff like that that he threw in, too. Uh, but at least you knew what you were getting. So I did that one, and I've done a couple of the Comics Elite mystery boxes before, too. Usually you you know, the ones I get, you know one thing you're getting in there, and I'm like, okay, I'm cool with just that. Everything else is sort of a freebie and just kind of a fun surprise. Um, with Comics Elite, it, it became pretty obvious that what you were going to get were their exclusive covers that they do on their site. So if you get some of those, you probably don't want to get the mystery box, but if you like them and don't get those, maybe go for the mystery box. Hey James, how's it going? Oh yeah, you saw that video? That's cool. Yeah, um, it was funny. I actually got the number one box out of out of all the boxes he did too. So uh, I actually confirmed that with him. I, I messaged him on Instagram. I'm like, hey, this has like a one of, I can't remember if it was 50 or 100 right now, whatever it was. It had a one on it. Does that mean it was the first box? And he was like, yeah, you got the first box. So that's kind of cool. So I kept the box. Uh, I love his channel. He's, he's one of the YouTubers that actually got me into doing this. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of great YouTube creators out there. 
uh, very Gary, um, ETA, Nick, uh, economics and comics, Reggie collects, you know, there, there's a lot of good ones out there, of course. Um, and they're all inspiring when, when you watch their channel and you're like, Hey, these guys are passing on information. Um, they're entertaining people. They're sharing their comic history and they're, and they're collecting with comics. And, you know, that was part of why I wanted to start doing this. Yeah, I did open the torpedo box. Uh, again, I'll just show that real fast. So I did get the um, the trade dress cover there. That's GI Joe 275, and then it came with the the Virgin as well. So super cool Destro cover. Yeah, uh, Skeffs is another good one. Uh, I, I do watch Skeffs channel. Um, I sort of discovered Skeff after I started making my stuff. Um, I definitely appreciate his style. It's actually one of those ones that, you know, I, I tried to not really emulate his style, but he's very genuine and you can tell he's very genuine the way he talks, the way he comes across. And in other words, just tries to be himself. And that's what I try to do too. try to, you know, stay positive about things. I don't like to get too negative about certain topics that can be negative in the comic book community. Uh, comically correct. I haven't seen any comically correct stuff. Um, I have heard a few times that they're pretty good. Uh, so I'm gonna have to add that to my list. I've got a, a decent sized list of channels I need to check out. There's just a lot of YouTube stuff out there. Uh, luckily my day job does kind of let me watch YouTube and stuff on the side. So that's probably where I'll check a lot of these out. Yeah. Skeff is jelly. Exactly. Yeah, he stays upbeat. That's kind of what I like about Reggie Collects, too. They stay upbeat, um, try to interject some of that positivity into comics because there's just so many so many cynics in the comic world. And, and I'm guilty of that from time to time, too, especially when it comes to our hobby and things we like. Um, but, yeah, I, I definitely uh, want to keep that positivity going because I think it's, it's just so important right now. Um, L O T L B. Um, I'm not familiar with that one, Brick Hunter. You'll you'll probably type it out, and I'll know exactly what it is. But it's just not ringing a bell right now. So, um, uh, am I using Streamyard? No, right now I'm using OBS um, directly plugged into uh, the YouTube live stream, uh, and then I have my OBS set up right now with some settings I found on a channel that was advertising, hey, these are some some good live streaming settings. It's different than my normal recording setup, so I gotta make sure that I switch it back when I'm done. Um, it's basically a different bit rate that it's recording at. Oh, Lords of the Longbox, yeah, sure, totally. Uh, I've heard of them too. Um, I think, does one of the people from Lords of the Longbox do Tales from the Flip Side? I, I could have that mixed up, but I think maybe they do. Uh, am I going to watch the Snyder Cut? Yeah, you bet. Um, you know, uh, anything comic related for movies, uh, I'm almost certainly going to check it out. Um, there's been a couple exceptions. Like, I never watched Bloodshot. I just haven't seen it yet. Um, I, I probably still will at some point. Uh, but yeah, bigger stuff like that, definitely. Um, I'm really hit or miss on the DC Universe stuff. I think some of it's been really cool. Like the first Wonder Woman movie was awesome. Um, second one, the first half was kind of cool. Uh, um, Aquaman was really good. Um, so my first experience with Justice League, the film, was watching the uh, Ultimate Cut or the Ultimate Edition, uh, the extra long version. And I didn't think it was that bad. Like, I know a lot of people hate it on the theatrical release, and I've never seen the theatrical release. Maybe it's way different, um, but I, I definitely thought it was okay. Um, so I'm excited for the Snyder Cut. I, I have a feeling it's going to be... Um, my optimism is, isn't super high, but hopefully it's better than my expectations. Uh, James just watched Suicide Squad for the first time, and yikes. Yeah, um... Suicide Squad is one that was like a guilty pleasure for me. I, I actually did sort of enjoy the, just the stupidity of that movie. Uh, like the scene where they're all just mowing down the infected uh, humans and stuff like that in the street was kind of cool. Um, but 
it <laughs> it's a movie that like it, it had a feeling of like it just fell apart somewhere halfway through and just focused on being cool. I would be interested to see like there, there's a um, uh, the director's escaping me right now, but th- there's rumors that there's going to be a director's cut for that. That could be interesting because it does feel like I know a lot of Jared Leto, Jared Leto Joker stuff supposedly got cut out. So uh, BVS Ultimate Edition is great. Theatrical version cuts out really important scenes for context of the rest of the movie. Okay, that's interesting, James. That kind of meshes with what I've heard from some people about the theatrical cut. Um, I'm a critic of DC movies. I wish they were better as a whole. I really want them to thrive and be better. Yeah, that's that's the interesting thing about the DC stuff is they've gone for this darker tone, um, probably because of the success of the Tim Burton Batman movies back in the early 90s, I would guess, um, and, and how successful they were. Plus, you got the whole um, Batman Begins and Dark Knight, which were obviously darker movies. And I feel like they wanted to lean into that Christian Bale, Tim Burton kind of tone for their movies. And obviously Marvel is con for the comedic, uh, colorful, just bright, generic almost in a way, but in a way that works. Uh, and I feel like it'd be interesting if, if DC tried to capture more of that energy or did their own thing. And I, I mean, there's a lot of talk that with Flashpoint, they're going to reset how we see what's going on with the DC EU. Um, and also DCEU is just a terrible name. So let's let's change that while we're at it too, okay? Um, but yeah, I mean, if they can reset with Flashpoint, I think that'd be really interesting. Um, if, if it allowed them to pick and choose the best elements from each of those films they've released, you know, take the, the good from Wonder Woman, take the good from Aquaman, uh, eliminate the bad from... Well, I don't want to say bad for Man of Steel, but... It, it you know kind of rewrite that because it sounds like Henry Cavill probably isn't reprising his role as Superman at this point. So figure out a different way to do Superman. Maybe not make him a focus of his own movie. I don't think anybody's really done Superman right in a long time on the screen. So it'd be interesting to see if they could pull that off. Um, ah, yeah, David Iyer. That's right. Um, yeah, he's the one that did Suicide Squad. Uh, GT Key Comic wants to know my views on the Inyak and Bad Idea situation. Um, so I did a video on Bad Idea uh, shortly after watching Sean from Comics Elite do sort of the the breakdown of what Bad Idea is about. So some of my takes in that video, uh, I wasn't aware of all the information. I don't think a lot of people were really. Um, <laughs> Yeah, oddly enough, there is a situation with Bad Idea. Uh, um, Basically, the things that I'm happy about that I've heard about since that video are that it sounds like the not first print, which is another bad name, in my opinion. I get it. It's kind of tongue-in-cheek. I feel like that whole concept of like an unlimited second print run they're doing makes up for a lot of the problems I had because my biggest issue with them is I wanted to get the comics. I wanted to check them out and they were next to impossible for me to get in my area. Um, so I, I've told this before. I'm sorry if you've heard this before on my channel, but I have one comic shop that's about 30 minutes away from me. Um, that is, they, they've got a lot of back issues. They have some new stuff, but they're primarily a gaming shop. They, they've leaned pretty heavily into the tabletop gaming and they do that, you know, Friday nights and stuff in the, the back half of the store, like a lot of, like a lot of shops do. Um, and that's clearly their bigger focus. And then I have, so they're not going to do bad idea. Right. And then I have the other shop, which is the video I did about the shop. I'm never going back to. Um, that's, that's sort of what's made my channel kind of a big deal recently. Um, and I, I mean, obviously I wouldn't go back there because of that situation. Also, there's no way that guy is going to, to order those bad idea comics. So outside of those two shops, I would have to go about an hour and a half south um, or about two and a half hours north. And there's there's no way I can do that. Like, that's just not that's not feasible for me. Um, not on any kind of regular basis. Like I could do maybe one special trip that way. But there's no way I could regularly do that. And since you are, most places are having you commit to getting all four issues of the series, you'd have to go back. So I would have had to score them online 
to places like um, uh, Midtown, I think early on was selling them online. Um, and I would have had to done that. Those sold out pretty quick. Bad idea themselves. I don't understand how come they won't sell to customers directly through their web presence. That's all I wanted from them. Uh, if they'd been willing to do that, I definitely would have, you know, uh, picked up four issues, especially Inyak and uh, Tankers is the other series I think looks pretty cool. Both of those I wanted to check out, but I just don't have a way to read them. So that that's kind of my opinion on Bad Idea uh, for me personally, for how it affects the comics industry and, and comics collecting and especially LCSs, because that's really all of their business practices are focused on on LCS um, catering to LCSs and supporting them and in that respect I think they have some cool ideas I really like you know the idea of um, they're not going to collect trades um, you know they're asking all stores to sell at cover price I mean there's some neat stuff there um, you know the fact that if you order a hundred copies of Inyak number one you have to order a hundred copies of Inyak number four um, that whole concept makes a lot of sense to me. I hope that they tweak their approach or that potentially somebody else takes that idea and sort of revamps it. That would be my preferred goal there. Um, it does sound like, you know, there's been a lot of interviews with the uh, heads of Bad Idea. I haven't checked them out yet, but I've heard some stuff through the grapevine that they are listening to feedback. And that's promising. Uh, you know, it's not one of those things where I don't think they're out there just to generate scarcity. I think that they may have done that a little bit just to generate some buzz in the beginning. And now that their name's established, hopefully they don't try to do that again in the future. And I can't say that they did that for sure at all. That's just how it feels to me. It reminds me of some stuff I've seen um, back in the day with like Nintendo Wii. I worked at GameStop when Nintendo Wii launched and it was a huge deal and everybody wanted one because you couldn't find them and everybody wanted them. And it sort of became like a positive feedback loop. And I think that's a little bit of a, of a manufactured scarcity kind of a thing that they may have done to try to bring in some publicity. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully that's not true, but that's just what it feels like on the surface. Uh, Brick Hunter says he saw my video with the owner not letting me use my phone. Yeah, it, and I mean, that's it's really crazy. So Chris over at Journos Comics um, shared that video. And my my channel, I, I mean, I'm not a big channel still. Um, but even then, I, you know, especially then I was I was small, small, small potatoes. And that video just blew up um, literally overnight. And so I'm very thankful for him for watching that video and telling people that he liked what I was saying and go check it out. It really put a lot of eyes on what I was doing and it made this all feel a little bit more um, worthwhile. So that was really cool and I really appreciate that. And I've had you know a lot of cool contact with, you know, we talked about Skeff earlier. He stopped by, um, uh, Bill from Economics and Comics stopped by and left comments and checked out the video. And that's, that's really humbling because I just expected nobody to ever watch my channel, so. That was really cool. Uh, punch uh, James says punchline keys seem to be on the rise. Hello reason. Hello reason three is pushing three fifty plus shipping over the last week. Yeah, um, punchline is. You know, it's funny as I just read um, the the Batman Tinian run. Uh, I just started reading it. I read the first volume on Comicsology, and so. I, and I read Hell Arisen 3, too. I picked up a copy of that um, on Comixology. It's funny. I have three copies of Hell Arisen 3, never read them, and they're all slabbed. Um, and I, you know, I, I bought into people's buzz around that character, and I wanted to get in early and get some 9-8s um, and was treating it purely as a speculation thing. And now I've come around full circle because I've read some of the comics uh, and her cameo and her first appearance. And... You know, I do enjoy the character. I think it's cool. I mean, it's sort of this um, deconstruction of the Harley Quinn character and what it means to be um, Joker's partner in crime or sidekick, right? And so I just read the first fight between Harley and Punchline. That was really cool. Um, and I'm really digging that Tinian run. I know a lot of people are. And Tinian's work has just been out of the world, out of this world with, you know, something is killing the children is just on fire. So I wanted to check out the Batman stuff. I'm glad I did. 
And yeah, Punchline, uh, you know, with the one shot they just did, there's talks of her. I don't know if it was her getting her own series that I heard some buzz about. And that could have just been rumor mill stuff, but that's pretty cool. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I've got two copies of the A cover of Hello Risen 3 and, and a 9.8. So I'm definitely glad to hear that they're going up. And I've got uh, one copy of the B cover in a 9.6, too. Uh, Dream says, that comic shop video is the first video of yours I watched. I like your style. You're honest and fair. I, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, it, it, that's, it's funny. I recorded that video three times. And the first time I recorded it, the, the night after the encounter. And I just... I felt like I came out of the gate a little too hot. And, and in the newest version of the video, you hear me say that I wanted to let some time pass. And and that's true, but I did also record two other videos of me talking about it. And I just didn't like the way they felt. I didn't really want to approach it that way. And it's funny, that second time that I recorded the video, uh, I watched um, uh, Swagglehaus. Uh, I watched his video where he had a bad experience in an LCS. And I was like, oh, okay. I like what he's saying here. Like he's talking about how 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 it should affect your going into a comic shop in the future, and and what it means for the comics industry that we have shops that are behaving this way, right? Um, and so I I kind of was like, all right, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that tone a little bit more, and and that time that had passed really helped me put some perspective on that situation. And the funniest part about that is I actually in a private discord with some old coworkers, I mentioned that situation that day and two people were talking to me about it. And they're like, what? Oh, that's crazy. You know that that would happen. One of them's a comics fan. The other one uh, is from the town where I had the experience. So we were talking about it kind of on that level. And then I had one other person come in and say that I was being too harsh. Uh, on that comic shop and with the pandemic and small businesses struggling that me um, quote unquote, putting them on blast was the wrong thing to do, which was interesting because I never said I was going to put them on blast. I just said I wanted to do a video about the experience and sort of vent about it. Um, and so I ended up having the kind of those conversations that sort of informed the tone of that video a little bit where I wanted to make sure and give both sides of the story because I, I did understand it from his perspective, the owner's perspective. I do get it. Um, I would do things differently if I was in his shoes um, and definitely would approach that in a, in a very different manner. Um, there's things you can do that don't come across as fascist as that is like I hate to say that but that's kind of what it felt like like don't use your phone and 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 a couple people have made um uh, comments about the the car dealership analogy I gave in that video and that's how I feel like it is it's like this, we're talking about something that we can all look up the value we can all see what it's worth um comics have a changing but established value and any good that has an established value Every party should be able to approach that from the side of, of I have information about this and here's what grade this comic is and here's what that comic goes for in this grade. Um, and then all sides are above, above board on that. And I think that's the right way to approach things, even in private sales. Now, granted, you might have somebody who's selling comics who doesn't care about that. They just want to get rid of them. They just want to move them. And if people buy them for what they're selling them at, that's fine too. But I think that there's there's definitely when you're talking about a dedicated comics retailer who's selling mostly back issues, boy, you just got to price your comics. I don't know what else to tell you. Like if you have a, a you know twenty long boxes out and that's too much inventory for you to handle, well, it's a little silly. But if that is the case, pull most of your comics out, um, and and just only keep out the ones that you're confident in the price on or you know they're 10 cent or 25 cent books. If you want to do that, that's fine. But to have random keys out there and just say like, well, I'm going to pull all those keys and you're not going to be able to buy them. That's so weird to me. I think a lot of comic shops get more for those comics 
than if they were to take them and go sell them online. And that's that must be what he's doing. And if you're doing that and you're selling them on eBay, you're paying fees. Um, you're dealing with people who get their comics who then say that they were damaged in shipping, whether that's true or not. But that has to be factored in because you have to either give them partial refunds, um, take return shipping on those items back. There's a lot of cost and time and effort involved in that. And most people that walk into LCSs know that. And they know if they're buying it, they're going to pay maybe slightly more than they'd pay online, but maybe less than they would with shipping. Uh, and you can you can really sell your books for more that way because there's the there's the immediate satisfaction factor, right? Like I walk in, I pull whatever comic out of whatever bin, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, man, that's a great price, and I can see the condition. I don't have to worry about the online seller being a scammer or any of that kind of stuff. And you buy from them. And that just makes way more sense to me to to sell that way. But um, yeah, anyways, I, I guess he didn't see it that way. <laughs> uh, going back to, uh, I think we can relate because we all ran into weird. Yeah, there's so many weird comic shops, and I mean that's that's part of the allure in some ways. I think is just how how finicky comic shop owners are. And, you know, there's the the Simpsons comic book shop guy and, and, you know, those types of personalities. And I've encountered those guys. I'm sure we all have. Um, there's the really cool ones. There's the ones that just want to talk all day. There's, you know, there's all those different types of personalities. And, and seeing that is really cool. I uh, saw a comment about a lot of, a lot of comic book prices are crazy high lately. Yeah, there's there's so much money being put into comics right now. And there's all this talk about whether or not it's a bubble, and uh, that's true of, of all collectibles markets right now, of course. Um, I've been checking out some baseball stuff, like baseball cards, because I have a bunch of Junk Wax era baseball cards lying around. I'm like, huh, should I sell these now? Like, what should I do with them? Um, and there's just there's just clearly a lot of people that either they have the time on their hands and they don't have money to, they, they don't have other things to spend their money on because they're stuck at home. Um, or, or, you know, they just realized like, Hey, I can finally go buy those comic books that I've wanted for 25 years. Uh, and now they're looking at them. I, I don't know what's driving it all. It's probably a combination of all those things, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of money going into comics. Uh, GT key comic wanted to know about, um, getting my views on AI grading, replacing human grading. Um, so yeah, I think that it's probably easier to a large degree with baseball cards or sports cards um, just based on the two dimensionality of the card itself. So I do wonder as you start to take into account uh, multiple pages, um, having to be able to see those pages from multiple angles to judge certain defects. Like, I don't mean, we've all done it right as we're grading comics. You, kind of take a comic and you have to hold it up to a, the light in a certain way just to get the reflection to go off of it to see certain imperfections. I'm positive there's ways to overcome that when it comes to computer grading and AI grading, um, but I am curious to see to see how effective that would be uh, and learn what the margin of error is. I believe that's already the case for when uh, CBCS does their verified signature program. Uh, I believe they're using that Beckett technology for the signatures to authenticate them. So in a way, we already have some of that grading involved in comics. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a tough one. It, I'll tell you what, though. It's actually something I'll probably look into a little bit more because uh, that might be something that'd be cool to do a video about later. Uh, good question. Um Brick Hunter says Harley just got too big and popular to remain Joker sidekick, so it was a matter of time for a character like Punchline to appear. Yeah, I, I agree with that, like hundred uh, percent. She's gonna show up in the Harley animated series. Yeah, I, I, I so is that a hundred percent confirmed, or is that just it's it's a given because of her status? Uh, Yeah, Dream of August, I, I, I do appreciate that. Like, I, I've navigated a lot of sticky situations and difficult conversations in retail settings on the management side. And so I think I'm pretty chill until I'm not. 
And, um, you know, that, that's kind of my style. Like if, if, a, if a store or a shop or whatever policy goes too far or the employee steps over their line, um, I, I definitely reciprocate. <laughs> Um, and, and I have a lot of experience doing that. Um, and I also, you know, but I don't do it in a way that's, that's, um, violent or, or yelling at the person or anything like that. Like I just, I kind of just become sarcastic mostly and, and, uh, I'm not afraid to do that in those situations, but I'm never going to be the one that wants to start that. Hopefully, I mean, you know, everybody's the hero of their own story, and and there's probably times where I was the I was the asshole first or something, and, and didn't realize it. But I try never to be because I just know what it's like to be a, a retail employee um, in those stores, those kinds of stores, and, and specialty retail and all that kind of stuff. And you deal with so many people that you know they just they they say whatever they want to get their way. It really wears you down. So. I try to approach that from a place of empathy and just be as nice as I can to those people. I try to like ask intelligent questions instead of really dumb questions that they hear all the time, or at least I try to, you know, I, I do my best. So that's all you can really do, but uh, be nice to retail workers. Um, if you've never been in retail, it, it's, uh, it's not fun a lot of times. And um, there's a lot of jerks out there. Uh, James says anytime he's in a shop, he checks his phone. Yeah, it, I mean, right, like, you, you kind of just have to. I mean, first of all, you want to know if there's any value in it. Um, especially, you know, if, if you're into reselling stuff, um, you pretty much have to. So, definitely. Uh, James says it's a given. She would fit so well naturally for that universe. Yeah, the... The question that I'd have about that is, would DC want to do that from a creative standpoint? Because if they're really trying to replicate um, the Harley phenomenon, if she shows up in Harley, does she just become a two-bit Harley villain? That, that'd be the question I think that, that's interesting there. Um, hey, my wife's getting achievements over in Skyrim there, guys. Give her a thumbs up. 10, ga 10 gamer score right there. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'd like to see punchline adapted. Um, you know, again, hopefully with the DCEU stuff we talked about earlier, hopefully they smooth some of that stuff out before they introduce her into the movies. Um, she's such a new character that, that I'd like to see, you know, her kind of ironed out or fleshed out a little bit before we see her in film. Um, Wow, Brick Hunter has five LCS stores all within a 20 minute drive. Uh, only one has a long line for Wednesdays. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's true. And that's crazy, by the way. Congratulations on having um, so many LCSs around. Uh, I, I was fortunate to enough to live in a couple smaller metro areas that had comic shops. Um, but it's just it's a it's a really nice thing uh, especially these days because i'd love to go dive through some bins um a good casting choice for punchline Ooh, that's a really good question i don't know i'd have to think about that one for a while do you have somebody in mind yourself let's see so um see if any more questions roll in here um Kind of before I, I go today, I'm just going to throw out some of the stuff I've been reading because uh, I don't really have another spot to talk about it. And this you know, might be my new format for doing that. Um, I don't really read a lot of very current stuff. Like I just said, I was reading the, the Tinian Batman stuff not that long ago. Um, I just read uh, Ten of Swords. And a lot of people did not like Ten of Swords. Uh, I thought it was cool. I really liked it. Um, I thought it was a little hokey in the middle... Um, battles they had where um you know there were some of the the contests were like arm wrestling or um eating contests like i i did hope for more actual fights um but other than that i thought it was a really cool story i thought it was really neat to see apocalypse's history get flushed out a little bit more um so we got some casting recommendations rolling in here so for punchline we have 
Aubrey Plaza, Chloe Bennett, Olivia Munn. Those are those are pretty good ones. Um, they definitely have the look right. Um, out of those, I feel like Aubrey Plaza, just from her stuff in Legion, um, probably has the right demented kind of of capability. Um, I need to read the Punchline special too, though, because I haven't read that yet. I've heard it sort of a little bit more of her origin story, so I don't really know, um, you know, what her what her whole history is, just how she acted in the the lead up to Joker War, but. Uh, I could see that Olivia Munn. I could see that too, maybe, but she's so good at lighthearted stuff. Um, I don't know if she'd be a great choice. And Chloe Bennett, yeah. Um, I actually just picked up a couple copies of uh, Secret War Two, which is Quake's first appearance, uh, because she's apparently coming back in her MCU role as Quake. And I really liked her on Agents of Shield, but that show it just got so hokey for me. I couldn't keep doing it. Um, and I, and I, the acting ability of some of the actors, sometimes I called it into question and she's one of them. I'm not sure she has the chops. Um, but I could, I could completely be selling her short because that show is, you know, it's an ABC drama. It's written a certain way, kind of, kind of like how most CW shows are written a certain way where they're, they're lighthearted, they're a little light on the drama uh, the actual drama and a little bit heavy on the soap opera style drama. And Agents of Seal Shield was kind of like that too. And yeah, she's going to be in Powerpuff Girls. So between Powerpuff Girls and Quake, could she also play Punchline? It's interesting. We've definitely been, you know, the MCU's kind of gotten a little bit older in the tooth. We've seen actors start being talked about jumping back and forth between like DC stuff and Marvel stuff and vice versa. Like uh, Henry Cavill, who is rumored to be potentially joining the MCU. A lot of people think probably as Captain Britain, which would be very interesting. Um, so yeah, we, we have seen kind of actors switch back and forth. We got Christian Bale coming as Gore, the God Butcher. So potentially, um, <laughs> yeah, Brick, I, it's funny. I, I've always, I've always been around, uh, uh, plenty of girls that, that were better at games than me. So I don't know if I share that, that same opinion exactly, but she, yeah, she's Thank th you. thumbs up for, for doing a good job on, on the Skyrim. Um, I, I remember like my, my cousin schooling me at Mario when I was like six and, uh, she was way better than me. So, um, he'd make a good Adam Warlock, uh, Henry Cavill. Uh, that'd be interesting. I haven't even really thought about who I want to be Adam Warlock. Uh, yeah, that could be, that could be interesting. I, I think I'm just such an X-Men nerd that the idea of Captain Britain coming to the MCU just makes me excited. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, again, while waiting for some more chat to roll in here, uh, what else have I been reading? Um, I've been reading a lot of older stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm going back through X-Men. Um, the essential collection stuff, uh, reading those trades, uh, pretty much all the comics I read these days are on comiXology. It's just way easier for me to sit down on my tablet and read them. I know a lot of people don't like reading comics that way. I love it. The whole guided view thing is really slick. Uh, so I've been reading that. Um, I've been reading, uh, Batman no man's land too. Uh, cause I never read that storyline before. And, Boy, that late '90s um, DC art is is rough. I mean, it was it was rough everywhere. All the artists were on indies or Image or whatever. Uh, James says he read Gotham by Gaslight for the first time last week. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, that's one that's been recommended to me too. So um, that's probably getting bumped on my list actually. Um, yeah. Let's see what else I've been reading. Um, read floppy cop you know that's a good suggestion i i think uh i think i might have to do that does he wear a cool hat uh long term what it series has more legs something killing the children or department of truth well more legs in terms of overall popularity 
or in terms of the actual comic book. Um, I think something is killing the children, or or just mean in terms of investment. It's gonna be slightly different, even though they're they're all kind of connected. I think something is killing the children is gonna be huge because that's definitely getting adapted um, into a series at some point. There's no way it's not going to, and if anything has the potential to be the next The Walking Dead style show um, or Game of Thrones, like as far as adaptation goes, I think there's two candidates. One is Why the Last Man, which is currently, I think, in pre-production or something like that. I think that could be a big deal. And the other is something that's killing the children. That's just my opinion. But um, Department of Truth is already in talks. I mean, you know, we, we hear the we see the alerts. <laughs> it's it's been talked about for a while. Um so I definitely think that that one's going to be, become adapted as well and it really just depends on how well it's done. I think something is killing the children is a little bit more foolproof and I think it's going to have a little bit more wider appeal. Um with Department of Truth, I hope they do it right, but Part of me thinks that people might be kind of burnt out talking about conspiracy theories. Um, you know, maybe not everybody, but I think there's a, a good segment of the population that's a little tired of it right now. Um, but yeah, definitely both both series that I'd like to see get adapted. And as we've learned from comics, the success of those adaptations will determine the value of those comics. They're just going to be hand in hand. Um if I was a betting person and I had to put money on it, I would definitely say something is killing the children. However, if you're looking to invest in comics right now, I think you're going to have a, a, a cheaper buy-in for Department of Truth. But also, the print runs were, were higher, so there's not going to be as much scarcity. Um, Department of Truth is X-Files. Yeah, that's the other thing I've heard about Department of Truth. Um, and X-Files is beloved. I loved X-Files. I mean, I watched it week to week when I was a kid. Um, uh, or a teenager, not really a kid, I guess. Um, and yeah, it, it really, really spoke to a lot of people. But no um, resurgence of X-Files has really done that well. Like, the new stuff they tried to do didn't really hit. Um, the When it came to Netflix, I remember it was like a big deal for like a week and then no one cared. Um I don't know. I'd really like to see both series done right on screen. Like if they are adapted, I want to see the best from both of them. Um, and, and ultimately I just want every adaptation to be successful because so many of them are bad. Uh, investment overall value of the series. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, it's it's sort of it. I think overall investment value is something that's killing the children. For a long time, will probably be the champion. Um, the values are already there, um, and I know Department of Truth is definitely catching up. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the more I think about it, you're probably right. Um, the the it's in the zeitgeist right now, right? Like. Something is killing the children is kind of that that morbid series that I think will appeal to a lot of people, but Department of Truth, like the whole conspiracy thing, it is in the zeitgeist. You're you're probably right. That probably would help. But also, like if they started making it today, how long before it's actually on on the air on like a streaming service or whatever? Like a year, two years. Um, from everything we know, it's it's essentially being shopped right now. So I think we still have a while before we see it on screen. Um, and, and the same thing's true with something is killing the children. So I think it depends on when each one lands. Uh, if either series could be ready today during the lockdown when streaming is huge, they would just crush it. All right, guys, we'll probably get in the stream kind of soon. Uh, anybody else have any questions that they want to throw out there? I'm definitely here to answer a couple more, but it's getting a little late. And again, this was mostly just a test to make sure I, I could make this work. Oh yeah, and if you are curious, um, it's been a while since I showed them off. 
but I did get uh, the Torpedo Mystery Box G.I. Joe comics here. Um, got the Virgin cover in the box and the trade. So kind of a cool um, Destro cover, kind of a kind of a man in the iron mask thing going on there. Uh, Brick Hunter says something's killing the children. Mature version of Stranger Things. Department of Truth is a mature version of X Files. Yeah, and it's it's really hard to say which of those would ultimately prove better. Um, and again, hopefully they're just both well done. If if they were both equal shows and came out of the gate strong, I give the edge to something that's killing the children just because I think it appeals to a little bit more established um, tropes with like kids can see the monsters, but the adults can't. Kids have to go after the monsters. Um, and then on top of that, Erica Slaughter is a very um, kick-ass, cool character. Um, yeah, either way, both Tinian. Right, uh, kind of the theme of, of the night. You know, I was reading the the Batman Tinian stuff and talking about how cool Punchline is, um, and then you got these two Tinian series. Uh, everyone says Donny Cates is the man, and he he writes some cool stuff. Uh, that Venom run definitely has some neat stuff. The Thor run has some cool stuff, but Tinian actually delivers like the complete stories all the way through, which is pretty cool. Uh yeah, Economics Comics best writer currently. I I agree. Like there there's other writers I certainly love, um but no one's putting out stuff, especially firing on all cylinders on multiple series at the same time like Tinian is. Um <laughs> yep, we're definitely going to see cosplayers of Erica Slaughter. It's really funny we're not seeing more already like come on, she wears a mask. It's it's you know, you could you could cosplay as Erica Slaughter in real life walking around. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. Tinian creates, um, and and I think we're in a in a world right now that is starved for some original ideas. Um, you know, you think about all the sequel uh, fatigue and adaptations and everything that's got you know the the comics and movies are putting out right now. A lot of it is just recycled stuff we've seen over and over again. All right, guys. Well, uh, it's fun chatting with y'all. Uh, nice seeing a few people in here, but I don't see a ton more uh, uh, questions or anything like that streaming in. Um, oh, oh, guys, we're getting an economics and comics uh, uh, news drop right here. Uh, so definitely worth checking out. Um, but yeah, I think I'm gonna be calling it a night too. Um, I'll, I'll probably be doing more of these. It was cool to do it. Uh, and like uh, I was talking about, um, earlier, um, with, uh, dream of August, I'm probably going to be, um, heading to the show and doing a little bit of an interview there at some point too. I'll make sure to post that up when it happens. Uh, I do have a video dropping tomorrow. I'm doing a, uh, a preview of my CGC signature series submission for the Chris Claremont signing. Uh, I submitted five books, um, X-Men 100, X-Men 120, X-Men 141, uh, X-Men 221 and Wolverine 1. And uh, the whole format of the video is you can watch along with me as I show detailed pictures of the comics. And what I want you to do is go ahead and tell me what you think the comic grades at in the comments um, to let me know, hey, you know, based on what I'm seeing, I think that's an 8.0 or, or whatever. And we can kind of play along. And then when the comics finally come, I'll do an unboxing and I'll go back to the comments and anybody who got it right, I'll make sure to, to point them out in the video. So um, that's basically what I have going on this week. Uh, also might try to get a video out where I look at the new house of X um, Marvel legends figures. Uh, I got Cyclops, the Wolverine, uh, Moira McTaggart and professor X. So I'll be taking a look at those in a video, just kind of doing an overview of that wave. Um, Wish your YouTube name has your name so we know what to call you, i.e. Comic Tom or Reggie Collect. Uh, so I, I do, in some of my intros, I try to say, this is Christopher, your Bronze Age nerd. Um, and I did that just because I know some people do prefer the name. Uh, my name is Christopher. Uh, so yeah, that's what you can call me. And, and I'll try to do that more often in my videos because I know the whole handle thing, you know, people, people want to know your name, so... 
<laughs> Should we call you Bronze or Nerd? Um, you can just call me the Bronze Age Nerd. Uh, or Christopher, either one. Or hey you, I, I respond to all of them. Um, <laughs> all right, guys. Well, it's been really fun chatting with you all. I didn't expect anybody to drop in, so it was really, really cool to see all of you come in and start talking and asking questions. Um, no, I'm Bronze Age. I mean, you know, whatever you want to call me. As long as people are calling my name, I'm happy. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you guys all have a great night, and I will see you around.